Okay, guys, welcome to What's in the Night Sky for November 2019, and there's some pretty exciting stuff going on this month. Firstly, Mercury will transit the Sun, something that only happens once every several years. We also have the Taurids meteor shower, which does bring about some fireballs. We also have the Leonids meteor shower. It's a great month for planets, as all five of the visible planets are available this month, and there are also plenty of opportunities to get the Star Trackers out. But before we deep dive into all of that, a quick message from the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 29,000 classes in design, business, and all things photography and videography. If you're looking to brush up on your landscape astrophotography, then you should check out this course by Ian Norman, the guy behind LonelySpec.com. He covers all the basics you need to know to capture and edit amazing nightscape images that include things like the Milky Way. There's also another course run by adventure photographer and Instagram legend Chris Burkhard. He teaches teaches you outdoor photography from sunset to sunrise and even capturing wonderful images in the nighttime that exists between. Skillshare is super affordable, an annual subscription costs just £7 a month and that gives you access to all of the courses and you can try as many as you like. But if you use the link in the video description below, you can get two months free of Skillshare Premium. So you can try out as many classes as you like. So follow that link in the description below and you can get two months free of Skillshare Premium. Okay guys, welcome to November 2019 and for those of you in countries that incorporate daylight savings time, the clocks have now gone back and darkness is falling much earlier. So before we get into the special events this month, let's take a general look at the night sky. So for those in the northern hemisphere, you can enjoy some long, cold nights this month. In the evening skies facing north, Ursa Major can be found low on the horizon in its upright position. Facing west, we still have the great rift of the Milky Way standing perpendicular to the horizon. And as we approach midnight, the Cygnus region is left standing upright in the northwestern skies. Then from midnight on facing southeast, you'll find the full winter circle. This is Procyon from the constellation Canis Minor, Castor and Pollux, the heads of the twins Gemini, Capella, the bright star from the constellation Auriga, and then you have Aldebaran from Taurus with Pleiades just above. Below that you have Rigel, one of Orion's feet, and then last to rise is Sirius of Canis Major, the brightest star in the night sky. These bright stars from various constellations all together make the asterism the winter circle, and it's a fantastic area of the night sky. There are just so many bright, colourful stars in that region of the night sky and it's a joy to photograph. It does cover a large area of the night sky as well so you will probably have to take a panorama if you want to include the entire winter circle. If you're looking to use your star trackers this month in the northern hemisphere there are a few interesting targets so just as darkness falls the Cygnus region of the Milky Way is overhead and this is home to the North American Nebula, the Pelican Nebula, the Veil Nebula and the Sada region, which is very rich in hydrogen alpha emission nebulae. So if you have an astro modified camera, it can be especially a good target. As you approach midnight, Andromeda starts to reach a favourable position directly over your head. And if you're willing to stay up later into the early hours of the morning, there are a number of jewels that cross the southern meridian. And as objects cross the southern meridian, they reach their highest position in the night sky. So there's the open star cluster Pleiades, the California Nebula, the Rosette Nebula, and of course the ever popular Orion Nebula. And all of these are pretty good targets for a basic camera, a telephoto lens, and a decent little Star Trekker. And before I start talking about the Southern Hemisphere, those in the Northern Hemisphere should probably be aware that it is, of course, Northern Lights season. So keep an eye on the solar activity and follow along the space weather just in case there are any geomagnetic storms on the way. Those in the Southern Hemisphere are now enjoying warmer but shorter nights. In the late evening skies, the large and small Magellanic clouds can be found high in the Southern skies and the Andromeda galaxy is arching across the northern horizon. As you go into the early hours of the morning, the winter circle passes into the northeast and there's even an opportunity for a Milky Way arch with Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, sitting 
at the apex of the arch high in the eastern skies. Now as for special events this month, on the 11th we have a transit. Mercury will transit the disk of the Sun. So as Mercury is closer to the Sun than Earth, once every several years we get to see it cross the face of the Sun. The last one was in 2016, but the next one is not until 2032. So it's an event that you may not want to miss. Now whether or not you'll be able to see the transit depends on your location, with Australia and Asia missing out this time around. But I'll drop a link to the website timeanddate.com in the video description below, as that website allows you to drop a pin on the map and it gives you a good detailed information about the transit from your exact location. You will need a long focal length in order to see Mercury on the disk of the Sun. I recommend at least 600 mil on a full frame, so get your moon bazookas ready. And of course, you will need a solar filter, otherwise you risk damaging your camera and lens. You can make your own using beta solar film, or you can buy one that comes with a mount already, and I'll drop links to both the beta film and the ready-made solar filters in the video description below. And of course, if you want to observe, do not look at the Sun without protection on your eyes, but you're not going to be able to see Mercury with the naked eye anyway. Now, as we're talking about Mercury, there's also a good opportunity to photograph it with a wide-angle lens this month. Mercury is, of course, the most elusive of the visible planets, and as it's the closest to the Sun, it's never too far away from the Sun in the sky, so you only ever get to see it in the morning or even in twilights. When Mercury reaches its farthest point from the Sun in the sky, it's known as its greatest elongation, and there are western and eastern elongations. As it orbits the Sun in about 88 days, it reaches these points about three times a year on average. However, it's a particularly good time of year for an elongation to occur, as the ecliptic is angled steep against the horizon. So this means that Mercury will be higher in the sky before sunrise. It starts to become visible in the southeast just before sunrise from the 18th of November, and it starts at a magnitude of about plus 1.2, but it will eventually brighten to a magnitude of minus 0.5 as it approaches greatest western elongation on the 28th. On the 25th, there's also an opportunity to capture Mercury alongside a crescent moon. As for the other planets, Mars can also be found in the southeast before sunrise. It's in the constellation Virgo, shining at a modest plus 1.2. It too can be photographed alongside a crescent moon on the morning of the 24th. In the evening skies facing southwest after sunset, you will find Jupiter in the constellation Ophiuchus, shining at a rather bright magnitude of minus 2.9. In the evening skies facing southwest after sunset, you'll find Jupiter, and that's in the constellation Ophiuchus, shining at a rather bright magnitude of minus 2.9, and it will set at around 6.30 p.m. Hot on Jupiter's tail, you'll find Saturn shining at a magnitude of plus 0.6, and that is in front of the constellation Sagittarius. Saturn sets about an hour after Jupiter, so about 7.30 p.m. As the month goes by, Venus will start reaching higher into the southwestern sky after sunset, and it's shining at a blazing magnitude of minus 3.9. It's the brightest object in the night sky after the moon. It can be found just one and a half degrees away from Jupiter on the 24th, and then on the 28th, you will find a crescent moon right between the two. So a fantastic opportunity for a photograph there. There's also a couple of close approaches of Saturn and the Moon this month. The first is on the 2nd, and then there's another similar opportunity at the end of the month on the 29th. Now there's a couple of active meteor showers to note this month, the first being the Torrid Meteor Shower. The Torrid Meteor Shower is an interesting one in that there are two streams of Torrid Meteors believed to have been split by the gravity of Jupiter into two branches, and this leads to two radiant points of the Meteor Shower, the North and South Taurus. Both of them peak on different dates, and estimations for the peak dates of activity disagree, but roughly the South Taurus peak on the 5th, and the North Taurus peak on the 12th. However, the Taurids do not have a strong peak, but they are more of a broad spread of meteors that are active from late October to early December. Unfortunately, the full moon coincides with the date of the peak of the North Taurids, so it's best to head out in the first week of November, close to the peak of the South Taurids, when the first quarter moon will be set in around midnight. This is great, as the Taurid meteor activity tends to pick up between midnight and the dawn twilight, so those first few days of November may be be good to get out 
and photograph some meteors. Now, as I mentioned last month, the Taurid meteor shower is known for an increased rate of fireballs, basically meteors that shine brighter than a magnitude of minus four, which is about the same as Venus. And just last month, Stephen Cheatley was very lucky not only to witness, but also to capture this absolute beauty of a fireball. So if you have clear skies this month, just try and get out and shoot as much as possible to increase your chances of capturing something like this. Next up, on the 17th to the 18th, we have the peak of the Leonid meteor shower, which in a dark sky, absent of moonlight and light pollution, can bring about 10 to 15 meteors per hour, but unfortunately the show will largely be hindered by a waning gibbous moon this year. Activity tends to pick up in the pre-dawn hours, and the peak is expected to arrive from midnight on the 17th to the pre-dawn hours of the 18th, but as already mentioned, the waning gibbous moon will unfortunately be in the sky during that period and it will largely reduce the number of meteors you can see and capture. Lastly, whilst it may not be a wonder of the night sky, it's worth mentioning that as the nights are now getting longer in the northern hemisphere, it can be a good time of year to do some nice long star trails. Make sure to get a lens warmer to prevent your lens from misting up and freezing over. And I'll drop a link in the video description below to the one that I use. And then as for battery life, if it's cold outside, you can stick a hand warmer to the battery door on your camera. Or you can power your camera via an external battery. Or maybe look at getting a battery grip for your camera to have a bit of extra juice. But we typically get some nice, crispy, clear nights over the winter and so it can be a good opportunity for some really nice long star trails. Now before I get onto the hashtag Wittens, just a quick update on the Wittens calendar. I was hoping to start delivery by the end of October, but unfortunately there was a delay, so I probably won't start dispatching for another week or two at max. But for those of you that have ordered already, you will receive an email once your order has been dispatched. And for those of you who haven't ordered, they will still be on sale at pre-order price for the next week or so. So link in the video description below for that. Now, for those of you that are new here, every month I set a subject for everyone to photograph, and then using the hashtag Wittens, I pick my favourite three every month. Last month, I asked you guys to send in your pics of the zodiacal light, which in past years hasn't gone very well, and admittedly, I probably shouldn't set it as a subject when it's available only in the pre-dawn hours. I probably should have set it when we have the evening zodiacal light in the springtime. However, as far as I can tell this month, we've received one image of the zodiacal light, and luckily it's a good image as well from Garth 60D, and this lovely coastal scene from Nova Scotia. And for that, I'm going to send you a free calendar as a prize. So please get in touch and let me know your delivery address, Garth. Well done. This month, I'm going to give away three calendars to my three favourite entries, and I think long cold nights ahead, I'd like to see your attempts at Star Trails. So upload your images of Star Trails using the hashtag Wittens for your chance to win a calendar and also to be featured in next month's video and on my Instagram account as well. That is it guys, now if you're new here and you haven't subscribed, please consider hitting that subscribe button so you don't miss out on this information every month. YouTube Analytics tells me that 50% of you guys who watch these videos are not subscribed, so let's change that, smash that subscribe button, and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies. Thank you.